Okay, I think we can get going. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see so many of you have been able to log in. A really big thank you and a really warm welcome from us at HL. So today we're talking about how we can help you improve the financial well-being of your employees. It's around about a half an hour session today, and our aim is to help you get to the bottom of how to get going and to share with you our new and exciting service called Financial Wellbeing at Work. We'd love to hear from you as we go along. To help keep things really simple at this end, could I please just ask you all to submit your questions using the Q&A rather than the chat. Hopefully you can see that Q&A button just at the bottom of your screen. My colleague Christian is helping me out today. He's behind the scenes and he's gonna make sure everything runs really smoothly today. So no pressure to you, Christian. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on the questions coming in and we'll do our best to get to as many of those as possible during the live Q&A at the end of the session. So first up, some embarrassing mugshots and some introductions. I'm Emma, I'm part of the team at HR Workplace and we work with lots of companies to help improve financial well-being for employees. My job today is to really sit back and to grill our fabulous panel of experts today. So our first panelist is Alistair. Alistair has loads of experience working with our clients at HL, and he'll be sharing his top tips on financial well-being. Delighted you can be with us, Alistair. Good morning. Good morning, Emma. Delighted to be here too. Good stuff. I'm glad to actually see you, Alistair, as I know your Wi-Fi dips in and out at times. That's a good start. Uh, next, we have Richard. Richard's very excited to be introducing our new financial wellbeing service. Morning, Richard. Morning, Emma. Very excited to be here. Good stuff. And we also welcome Claire from our team of financial wellbeing specialists. Claire's effectively on the ground delivering the financial education to employees week in, week out. Morning, Claire. Morning, Emma. Thank you for having me. Oh, great to have you with us. So before we chat to Alistair, I'd like to warm up everyone this morning with our first poll. We'd like to ask, what's the primary purpose of your financial wellbeing strategy? So hopefully you can see that on screen. And the options we've, we have here are to empower your employees, to help reduce financial stress, to help promote wider company benefits, or to perhaps broaden the agenda beyond just pensions. I'll just give that a minute for you to hit your answers to that one. Brilliant, thank you. Everyone's being very speedy, nearly there. Just a couple more people to vote, and then I will share the results with you. Okay, I'm just gonna share those results on screen now. So you will see that uh, the majority of people actually have a pretty broad agenda, and um, all of those things above apply to them. Um, but we can see quite a mix of things, certainly people looking to empower their employees and reduce financial stress. Thank you very much for participating. So now we will go over to Alistair. Alistair, you help loads of companies with their financial wellbeing strategy. So are you finding your clients are talking about it more now than ever before? Yeah, good morning, Emma. Um, yes, I would say absolutely they are talking about it um, more and more. I would say that this is a conversation we've been having for a number of years but actually COVID has definitely been um, something that has prompted and accelerated a lot of those discussions around around financial well-being. I would say that um, from, from, from those conversations I would glean that lots of companies are feeling pretty confident about talking about both physical and mental well-being but actually when it comes to financial well-being um, they're not quite so confident and yet they feel they have a real duty of care and a bit, it's a big concern they have a duty to address these things. 
but actually in my experience they're doing kind of little more than signposting perhaps their existing financial benefits or perhaps a, an EAP program employee assistance program okay and I know that financial well-being as a concept can be really tricky to define how would you define financial well-being it's a good question. It's, it's one of those words, a bit like employee engagement. Um, we think we all know exactly what it is, and it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, pretty hard to define, even more hard to, to actually measure it. I would say for me, it's about um, enabling employees to, to take back control, those areas of, of personal finance where they often feel a little bit out of control. And that's what leads to that financial stress. Um, it's about enhancing knowledge. Uh, definitely, it's about demystifying all the terrible jargon that is associated with financial products. Um, and it's about giving people both the confidence and the motivation to manage their money well. So it's no good just signposting all these great products unless you give people a reason to actually do it in the first place. And I think where it's delivered well, it has the effect of um, helping employees avoid over indebtedness. And it gets people starting to use financial products much more appropriately, which is great. And actually, obviously, that leads to happier, more productive and more engaged employees, which is going to be great from an HR perspective. Absolutely. Alistair, you just touched on some of the challenges that we face. What would you say are the biggest challenges to embedding financial well-being? OK, I mean, there's, there's undoubtedly lots of challenges around this. Um, I, I think for me, probably the biggest challenge is actually around changing the culture the way we talk about money you know in the uk we are not comfortable really talking about uh, about our money it's never really taught in schools um, and yet there is this expectation that you know when you you know become an adult you should just know this stuff you know the reality is um, and i would put myself in this basket too is actually you know you, you pick up bad habits along the way you know you start out in your career you pick up bad habits and they're never really redre redressed um, and so, you know, you find yourself, you know, here I am in sort of mid 40s and I'm still tempted by those spontaneous purchases that I really don't need. So, you know, the, to put that all together, you know, we don't really like talking about it. We're not really we don't really understand money that well. We are susceptible to making poor financial decisions. That's really the context we find ourselves in. But I would say there's a really exciting shift going on right now. And actually workplace is at the center of all of that. Um, there is a broad consensus, around about 88% of HR professionals who feel that they have a duty, that it's their responsibility to actually deliver financial wellness um, to, to their and support employees. And you've got around about the same proportion of employees, about 86% of employees who are looking to their employer for that support. And actually employers are uniquely positioned because if you think of all of the you know, life's key moments, they happen in the workplace. So from starting your career to moving jobs to you know, becoming a parent for the first time to moving house to sending kids to university, these are, these are all big life decisions and they have financial implications too. And so it feels like you know, we're all set for this big culture change. It just needs employers to actually go ahead and deliver this stuff. Absolutely. So it sounds like there, there is quite a lot to overcome, but it's incredibly worthwhile. What would you say are your top tips to help companies get started? Okay, so yeah, a quick, quick sort of top tips. I'd say firstly, it's really important that you start with your employees. You've got to find out what are the issues that, that are keeping them up at night. Don't assume you know what those issues are. And what you'll find is that if you actually address those issues, you're going to get a far higher participation rate and much more engagement with whatever program you're going to put on. Secondly, think about actually who's going to deliver this stuff. You know, are you going to do it in-house or are you actually going to get some, um, an external provider to do it for you? Um, if you are going to do it in-house, that's absolutely fine. It's, it's totally possible. Um, think about actually what, what resources you already have and then what gaps you have. So once you know what your employees want, if there are any gaps, you know, go and speak to your existing providers or advisors and see what resources they've got. There'll be lots of freely available um, tools, videos, calculators, all that sort of thing. Thirdly, um, I always say this to, my, uh, to my, my clients, start with the end in mind, i.e. what action do you want your employees to take um, having heard your messages? And then just remove every Every barrier to action you've got to make it easy so you know for example if you're going to talk to people about budgeting 
you know, you just send them a link to a budgeting tool so they can start to do that effectively. If you're gonna to talk to them about starting a savings habit, um, you need to direct them to where they can actually start saving. And ideally that should be through payroll. Um, fourthly, I would say, um, try to build in some kind of measure of success, a measure of effectiveness. You want to know how many people have clicked on that budgeting tool, or how many people have set up online access to their pension, or how many people have set up a, a payroll ISA alongside their pension. These are all measurable, and it helps you um, define whether it's been successful or not. And it's fine if it hasn't, you can actually go back and say, okay, what can we do differently next time? And then the final thing I'd say is, you know, aim for progress, not perfection. You know, this is a long-term journey. Financial wellness, financial education, it takes time. And it's all about those small marginal gains, which actually have a massive difference over the long term. So, for example, you know, a, just increasing your pension contributions by just 1% a year, it's a small change, but it has a disproportionate impact on your retirement outcomes. And so what you'll find is actually, as HR people, the more you commit, the more you deliver financial wellness, actually, the more refined and the more effective it becomes. And actually, that leads to, again, happier, more engaged, more productive employees. And that's got to be good from an HR perspective. Absolutely. Thanks ever so much, Alissa. You're an absolute fountain of knowledge. Really appreciate your input today. That's very useful. Um, Richard, if I can now come over to you to talk us through the launch of our new service, Financial Wellbeing at Work. Uh, I guess before we dive into that in any detail, it would be great just to share a little bit of context. So Richard, what's new about the service that we're launching today? Yeah, thanks Emma. Um, well, of course, we've already, we're already helping thousands of employees um, with their financial wellbeing and, and have been doing for well over a decade. And that usually comes as part of our workplace pension service. However, when COVID hit and people went into lockdown, we actually launched a, a, session, a free session of um, free sessions of financial well-being to help people through that particularly difficult period. That, that proved so popular. And as a result of that, we felt it was actually the right time to launch a standalone financial well-being service. So now we can actually work alongside existing pension providers and other benefits providers without actually you know, having to make any big changes on, on that side. So far, the response has just been incredibly positive from HR and reward managers that we've been talking to. Absolutely. And I know a huge amount of client feedback has fed into our new service. So how would you summarise what you've been hearing? Well, I think we need to look at it from two points of view. First of all, the employee and also the employer. So a lot of this is in line with what Alistair has already said. So if you're, if you're an employee, I think it's just really important to help feel, make them feel more confident, uh, empowering them to make smarter decisions with the money, you know, not being you know, making impromptu decisions that could cost them you know, long term. Secondly, I think it needs to be meaningful content for employees at every stage of their life. Now, that could be somebody you know, starting out uh, in their first job, you know, millennials uh, through to sort of uh, mid-age launches raising a family, right the way through to the, the, the day that you retire. Also, as Alice has said, it's got to be plain English. You, know, you don't need a jargon translator to, uh, to, to get through this stuff. It's got to be in, in language that people understand. So it's a really important point for employees. From an HR point of view, we know that HR agendas are just incredibly busy at the moment, so much on. That it's got to be easy. Uh, it's easy to implement, easy to run. Uh, it also needs to be low cost because you know, budgets are tight and trying to justify any extra spend on benefits is, is pretty tough at the moment. So it needs to be reasonably, reasonably priced. And also very important, it needs to be measurable so you can actually go back and justify uh, that it's been a success. So and, and another thing that was coming through is that um, employers were telling us that we, we need to be impartial, that they don't want their employees to be sold a product as part of the process. That makes sense. I think that sounds really spot on. I agree with all of that. OK, so could you walk us through the journey that we've mapped out for companies to help make things really easy? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's about filling the gap between what existing product providers already deliver, which is fine. Um, but, you know, pension providers will you know, tend to deliver uh, content, which is very pension and retirement related. So it's that gap between 
what pen product providers already deliver and full financial advice. So to start off with, it's so important to uh, work, to, to actually find out what employees want. So as Alistair said, um, you know, survey your employees, find out what's keeping them awake at night. And you can actually use our SurveyMonkey software if you want, and we can, we can help you put that together. Uh, once you've actually found out what your employees want, uh, then it's actually a matter of putting together uh, some communications so that people can actually you know, build up some sort of engagement, some sort of excitement about the event. So we will actually help you put together, or we can get our marketing team to write some really nice branded emails that, uh, that you can send out. We don't want your data, so we will just do the creative stuff behind the scenes, and then you can actually send those emails out to your employees. We'd also provide an electronic booking system so people can book into the webinars and the one-to-one -one meetings. And we we'll also you know, agree with you the best time, of, uh, best time to, to, to deliver those um, as well. So once people have actually engaged and they put themselves in, then they, then they attend the webinars. And we'd encourage clients to think about this as an event. So you could actually be running a financial wellbeing week or a financial wellbeing month. Uh, good times to think about it is maybe around a benefits review or if you've got a flexible benefits platform you know, around the, the, the benefits window. So we deliver the, the webinars um, and also uh, people will have the opportunity to book into one-to-one -one meetings. Now, the vast majority of the time, people can get the information and the, and the steer that they want through the webinars um, and the one-to-one -one cons consultations would just be for people who have particularly complex or, or high value situations but overall this just really helps people to engage with their own situation to work out what their own goals and objectives are uh, and to help them to make those, those better decisions however if people do have something that is particularly complex and i'm thinking you know, around maybe higher owner issues you know the annual allowance or maybe if you want to be setting up something around inheritance tax then there is actually a team of fee-based financial advisors that we can introduce them to um, but again, that's not an ulterior motive of ours. So they're just there if we need them. And indeed, people may already have their own uh, IFA anyway. So if we're working with you, then it, it, hopefully you can see that's, that's pretty easy so far. You know, we do most of the work behind the scenes for our clients. They'll have a dedicated team of contacts behind the scenes. So myself and my colleagues being there, um, you know, making sure that everything's running smoothly. And then at the end of the event, of the event um, we can actually then feed back in terms of a report to show you exactly what's gone on. So how many people registered, how many people actually attended, what were the most popular sessions, um, and also look at some of the subjective feedback. So, um, you know, on a confidential basis, you know, what sorts of comments people were making. That will make be some, that will give us some really good evidence to then evolve the pro process for the next time. So the next event, the next year, making sure that it's even better the next time around. Thanks, Richard. I guess um, the employee webinars and the one-to-ones are really at the heart of this service. So I'm now just gonna bring in Claire to find out a little bit more about that. Claire, can I first ask you about the webinar side of things? I know you deliver presentations to help empower employees. Could you give us a high level overview of the breadth of topics on offer? That's right. So there are 12 main sessions available. They're under four headings. So you've got financial education, guide to investment, financial planning and 50 plus. So we've had years of presenting these topics and these topics really land well with employees. There's something for everyone. So there is something at different life stages. For example, for those people in their 20s or perhaps early 30s, then getting onto the property ladder tends to be that top financial priority. So we want to make sure they save efficiently and that their money works as hard as they do. And it's really important to stress that all of the sessions have been designed so that they are informative, they're educational, we're not there to plug any particular products. Absolutely. And Claire, from your experience, could you give me a sense of which are the most popular subjects? 
Yeah, of course. So I'll pick out a few. So I'd firstly start with uh, how to start investing. It's a really key one, whether it be for medium or long term savings. There are new areas to chat through. So ESG is really popular at the moment. And it essentially explores that relationship between risk and reward, the hidden risk of inflation. It will also talk about how those savings could be used within tax efficient wrappers. So perhaps ISAs. But it's also really important for pensions because you're auto enrolled at the age of 22. But also you might need to use particular types of investments if you're then looking to move into drawdown at a later stage in life. Another topic that's become particularly popular recently is financial resilience. So due to the global pandemic, people are looking at emergency funds needing to have that rainy day money, but also the importance of having a valid will. And it also will raise awareness of other company benefits that are available. Quite similar to that is the budgeting and debt management. So really popular along millennials. So it will look at how you should start budgeting, how to save and will highlight sources of further guidance as well. And then a really popular one is the 50 plus category. So unsurprisingly, we tend to find that this particular area of people are naturally most engaged. They can see the light at the end of the tunnel in terms of pensions and pensions are naturally quite complex and it's the opportunity for us to really correct any misconceptions that employees might have so for instance a really popular one is that you have to take all of your tax free cash in one go you don't so it's the opportunity for us to explain the various ways in which you can withdraw money from your pension since the freedoms in 2015 actually it's much more flexible so individuals really need to get informed so that they're aware of the different implications and particularly the tax implications of how they take money out of their pension. Absolutely. Thank you, Claire. So if I can now just ask you a little bit more about the one to one meetings for employees. I know that our clients believe that to be one of the most valuable parts of our service and they tend to be really popular. Could you give us a sense of what's on employees minds? And I guess what I mean is what do you typically get asked in those one to one meetings? Of course. So one to ones get booked up really fast. It's the opportunity for employees to ask any questions about their personal circumstances or perhaps them to delve a little bit deeper into a webinar topic that they perhaps didn't fully understand. So the topics are really varied. So we might get asked about, you know, if their savings are on track, what they could do in terms of trying to hopefully boost those savings and the potential. We might get asked if they're a higher earner about the tax implications or how to save most tax efficiently. Um, time scales of investing is a really popular one as well. And in terms of recent topics, then ESG has certainly become much more popular. And I would say, actually, from my experience, women are more likely to ask about ethical and sustainable investments than men. Uh, but it's certainly becoming much more common. And I think that the global pandemic and climate change has highlighted that. Interesting. And I guess in the past, we've always provided this education face to face in companies offices. So how's the transition since the global pandemic been in terms of moving over to virtual sessions? How's that been received by clients? It's thankfully been a really smooth transition. So the presentations just became webinars and the webinars are held live, but actually they're also now recorded. So that means that they can be made available for employees at a later stage. And we've actually found that makes it much easier. It's more convenient for employees to sit down and watch the webinar at a time that works for them if they can't attend on the day. And ultimately, moving those sessions online has given employees more flexibility. So whilst they're working from home, we found as well that during webinars, we're receiving a lot more questions on average via the Q&A function than we would actually stereotypically receive when we're on location. So that Zoom combined with home working has actually meant that there's a unique opportunity for employees to ask questions more discreetly through their laptop or perhaps anonymously via the Q&A function rather than in a room full of their peers. That makes sense. And just finally, could you give us a sense of how qualified and experienced the team is uh, that will be providing the financial education to employees? Yes, so we're a team of 12 and the vast majority of us have achieved the CISI Diploma in Regulated Financial Planning. And those of us who haven't, we're studying towards it. So it's a young and dynamic team, which brings a different spin to often dry and complicated topics. So it's our job really to explain the unknown, engage your employees and talk them uh, through and teach them about different aspects of their finances. Absolutely. Thanks, Claire. I really appreciate you joining us. I know it's really valuable to hear from you as the closest touch point to employees. Thank you.
So Richard, if I can come back to you now, could you just share with us what's included in the Financial Wellbeing at Work package and the cost? Yeah, absolutely, Emma. And I think when we were putting this together, um, we just wanted to make it really you know, simple and, and low cost, but also transparent in terms of exactly what you're going to get. I think there's a lot of people putting together budgets at this time of year um, and trying to plan in what they want to offer their employees. So, you know, if there is going to be any extra spend, just to make sure that when you're presenting it to your board um, or your colleagues, that uh, you can actually very care, you know, very, very easily show what you're going to get. So we've got two packages, uh, a five day package and a 10 day package, uh, either at seven and a half thousand or at 13 and a half thousand pounds. And you can see there that you, uh, you very clearly Get what it says on the tin you know you've got the surveys the branded emails the online booking systems and with a five-day program you get 10 webinars so typically we might deliver two a day maybe one in the morning one at lunchtime you know, whatever works with for our clients also up to 40 one-to-one -one meetings on the five-day program um, and up to five topics so the idea of restricting the number of topics is just not to overwhelm people with too much information but also to make sure that it's really focused and targeted as a result of the surveys that we would have been doing earlier. If you've got, you know, if you're a bigger company and you've got lots of employees and you want to get, uh, you know, get the message out there wider, then the 10 day program just doubles up on all of those numbers that uh, we looked at, uh, except the price which comes in a bit lower. So hopefully, you know, competitive compared with, you know, what else is available out there, but also just very transparent and, and easy to, to understand what you get. Absolutely, thanks Richard. I'd just like to take a moment to thank our audience for questions coming in. We will get to those at the end of the session. Please do keep asking. And um, before we go to the live q and I'd just like to run a final poll. So this is really a bit of market research. And the question is, when might you next roll out a financial wellbeing initiative? So hopefully you can now see that on your screen. And the options are before April next year, uh, perhaps a little later on next year, perhaps after April, or would you be looking beyond that, perhaps to 2022 and beyond? Brilliant, lots of responses coming in. Just going to give that a few more moments to allow everyone to respond. Okay, fantastic. I will end the polling and just share the results with you. So um, it's probably fair to say there's a fairly split opinion. Um, some people are looking to do this pretty soon um, and 43% are thinking a little bit later on next year. So that's really positive. Thanks, every thanks everyone for that. Uh, we can now go to the live questions. Um, so please do use the Q&A button to ask anything that's on your mind. Alistair, I'm just going to kick off with one for you, if that's OK. Um, someone has said, I'm keen to implement a financial wellbeing programme, but I'm having difficulty getting senior management buy-in. What would you suggest? Is this for me? Yes. Hi. Um, yes. Yeah, so that, that's it's it's often I, we, I heard this a, a, a few times. I think um, I think as HR people and people in, in, in sort of benefits, we all know the benefits of, of financial wellness. But often um, senior management can 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 often focus quite a lot on the cost um, and they can sometimes be a little bit far removed from the reality of actually what's going on the ground in terms of employees, employees lives. I would say um, it's really important to focus on the the, sort of the tangible business benefits um, of of, the, of financial wellness and actually link financial well-being to things like absence rates, uh, employee engagement scores, employee retention, those sorts of things that will really um, that will sort of speak volumes. And we know that um, from surveys that around you know more than three quarters of uh, people surveyed believe that actually money worries actually impact them at work, so it's affecting the bottom line. 
Um, so, um, and I think if they're still not convinced, what you could sometimes do is, is actually, actually do like a, a taster session for their benefit. So you could maybe do a, a session on um, the pension allowances and see if, you know, they hopefully will get, you know, some benefit out of that and think actually we want to broaden this sort of financial wellness to the rest of the workforce. Thanks, Alistair. And another one here, um, perhaps for you, Richard. Um, is the package tailored in any way? So, for example, could you tweak the one-to-one -one meetings to above 80 for any extra fee, for example? Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, tailoring it maybe in a couple of ways, you know, tailoring something that is, is a bit more um, orientated around that your particular company benefits if you wanted to or tailored around your particular employee profile. We very much work with our clients uh, and consult with, with you before we, we roll anything out. In terms of the one-to-one -one meetings, yeah, if we get extra demand for one-to-ones, I think that's a great sign that, that people have engaged and it's popular. And yes, we can certainly provide more one-to-ones on a, on a day rate basis uh, beyond outside of those packages, um, but we'll just price up on a daily rate basis. Okay, lovely. And Claire, one for you, if that's okay. Uh, how many people can be on each webinar? So the limit is 500 in terms of the maximum capacity okay lovely um and i guess another one for you here is around the recording of the sessions could you just let us know how they're made available to employees of course so they're recorded and then they will be hosted on youtube the link will then be forwarded and can be emailed to employees and they can then watch that when convenient and at their own leisure super thanks claire and Richard, one for you. Would we be able to provide a taster session, for example, to senior execs? And would there be any associated cost for that? No, we'd, we'd be happy to do that. And I think that would just give you a really good taste for the, you know, the calibre of people that we've got working there. There wouldn't be any, any charge to that. Um, so you're happy to do that, yeah. Okay, lovely. Uh, Claire, another one for you. When it comes to ESG investing, what kind of guidance is offered around that? Yeah, absolutely. So we'll talk through the different methods of ESG investing. So more traditionally, there was something called negative screening where people might want to exclude particular industries. And now we've seen a move towards more positive, sustainable investing. So actually individuals looking to invest in companies that are looking to work towards the UN climate control goals and invest for a positive impact. So we'll explain how ESG and ethical investing is, is very broad. It can mean something different to everyone and we will point out sources of further guidance and where they can locate that specific information online. Super, thanks Claire. Um, a lot of people are wanting to engage with you so I'm going to keep firing some questions at you if that's okay. So another one here, could you let us know how long the webinars last? So the webinars vary, usually somewhere between 20 to 30 minutes, and we always allow plenty of time for any questions at the end as well. Super. And this is one that I know is, is very specific, but are we able to offer any guidance to international employees seconded to the UK? So we can discuss, I suppose, so it's all based on the UK legislation and if it was in terms of what the tax implications perhaps were in, in another country then that isn't something that we would be able to provide information on but if it's to do with perhaps how they can save efficiently here in the UK then yes we can help them with that. Super thank you. I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank anyone who needs to drop off the webinar at this point because I'm mindful we're overrunning a little bit so thanks ever so much for joining as we have um, quite a lot of questions to get through, I think we'll just tackle a few more uh, for those who have got time to stay with us. Um, just uh, perhaps, uh, I suppose a similar question, one here has said, is this tailored specifically to UK employees or can employees from global locations participate? For example, in those one-to-ones. Is this one for me again? I think so, yeah. I think it's okay. similar. Again, generally UK-based employees, because all of the rules and uh, scheme information generally will be geared towards the, the UK and the, the HMRC system that we have set up here. Uh, if they are international, but they're living and working in the UK, then it's, it's slightly different. Okay, 
Thanks, Claire. A final one for you, Richard, if that's okay. When would you say is a good time of year to launch financial wellbeing? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And I think a lot of it depends um, around what's happening at our, you know, at our clients' companies. So if you've got a flexible benefits um, window, that's often a really good time to do financial wellbeing leading up to that. It could be the end of the tax year. It could be around bonus time if people are eligible for bonuses. Uh, all sorts of events. If we can tie it into some sort of an event, which again makes it more meaningful for the employee, then I think you you, you get a lot more out of it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm mindful that that's probably all we have time for, but um, hopefully we can answer any further questions after this webinar. Um, <clears throat> so I guess that just leaves me to say a really big thank you on behalf of the team here at HL. You've been a lively audience, so thanks ever so much for participating. We do hope you enjoyed today's session. We'll be inviting you to our next Q&A webinar, which will be in a really similar format. And we're delighted to be joined by the very well-known Debbie O'Donovan from Reba. And we'll be chatting through the hot topic of the pension gender gap. So please do keep a lookout for an invite from us. You can also check out our videos and recordings on YouTube and connect with us via LinkedIn and Twitter. If you have any further questions about our Financial Wellbeing at Work service, please do just drop us a quick email and we will get back in touch. We'd love to hear from you. So finally, that is everything from us. Thanks again. Stay safe and have a great day.